Robin Schoet, it is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for making time. Uh, it's, I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're maybe let me start with this. You're you're not technically a coach, right? No. You've probably had touch points with coaching. You had a very very long career, um, uh, particularly in supervision over 40 years, and. Um, I, I wonder before we kind of uh, get into you, your approach, your perspective on transformation and working with people, but I'm I'm wondering about your your perspective on coaching and uh, how you understand it. Where to, what were your touch points so far? Go right in, right right from the word go. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I'm just debating as it's the first intervention, whether to be as controversial right from the beginning or to wait till later. Ah, but basically, jump um, right in. I think coaching, a lot of, a lot of coaching has lost its way. Mm -hmm. It's built on a false premise um, that it's about um, getting results And I say a lot of it because not, I don't think all of it's like that at all, but getting results, which has its place. But I feel that coaches are, well, okay, I'll go back further. When I first was introduced to the world of coaching. Um, What was that? It was about 1999, 2000, some, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And I was very naive. I didn't know what coach, and I went, You let your your clients mess you around. If they, oh. you, you know, they they can change things at the last minute and cancel a meeting and rearrange a meeting. I said, I just automatically as a therapist, you charge. You miss, you've got a date in the diary. I said, we can't do that. There, you know, there, there are clients. And I went, so what you're doing is you are telling them that they're in charge. And the whole purpose about being a coach or a consultant is they come to you because they're not managing. And if you let them stay in charge, you're not doing your work. You're just selling your soul. Patterns and one of their patterns that we can mess you around because we've been messed around. So oh. how can you model them unless you say, no, you pay me whatever, It's in the diary. That's it. You can cancel if you like, but you pay. Wouldn't that imply that a coach is not holding that boundary? When, yes. Whereas many coaches will, you know. Oh, sure. This was a long time ago, and uh, but it was my first. It was like I was baffled when I was supervising them huh. because I'd never understood that um, if you work for a, doing corporate stuff, that it seems part of the deal that you get messed around. It seems, you know, you paid a lot of money and, mm -hmm. and I kind of went, okay, because, you know, <laughs> that's how it works. But I was quite shocked mm -hmm. and they were quite surprised by me. So that was my first almost like introduction, <laughs> being completely baffled at why they were jumping around and, and, and actually frightened of their clients. And then the, oh. other, the other thing that... Yes, I think we're going to talk a lot about fear. Um, but the other thing that struck me was getting contracts and beauty parades, what we call beauty parades. Where, beauty parades. You know, mm, where about five or six people are tendering for a job. Uh -huh. And, you know, you have to do your beauty parade to show you're the best. And I said... Oh, okay, this is really interesting. And remember, I'm in a privileged position, so I'm not saying this is the only, everyone should be like me or whatever. I'm just explaining mm -hmm. what I do. Mm -hmm. I said, the first thing I do when somebody asks me for, for a piece of work is I ask, have you taken anybody else? Are you, have you asked anybody else? And if they say yes, I say, well, take them. I don't do competition. Mm -hmm. And then they go, but I want you. Well, then don't bother with anybody else it's just like no i'm not playing this game of uh you know because 
my belief is that the client must not be in charge. The client must not be in charge. Yes. Could you say a bit more? Yeah. And I'm being really provocative here. I can see it in your face for those people who are listening to this. <laughs> What happens is, is I don't mean it as a power struggle. I mean that basically if you're in a difficulty, it's because you haven't seen something. Mm -hmm. And if I wait to follow you, you might get there, you might not. It depends on your various factors. But you've come to me because I have a particular way of looking. Mm -hmm. And if I let you be in charge, then the bit of you that didn't want to know or didn't want to see is still running the show. Mm -hmm. And my job is to interrupt that. Right. So the client brings what they're bringing, but it's our job to interrupt them staying in their same patterns. Yes, basically. And people come to supervision to me, they want to tell me all about their client. Mm -hmm. And I go, there's no such thing as a client. Mm. It's only your version of the client. And your version of the client tells me more about you than it does about them. Because it's your version of it. Basically, um, when I say no such thing as a client, um, again, of course, being provocative, but what I'm saying is it's you describing your client. And the example I give is from a guy called Bruno Bettelheim, a psych psychologist and a psychiatrist. And yeah. he was supervising a student who was working with young people. And he said, The person I want to bring today, the student says, uh, is a, a young child who's destroying the environment. And Bettelheim says, a young child has a, a lot of difficulty destroying the environment. What exactly is he doing? And the student said, he's pulling down the curtains. And Bettelheim says, pulling down the curtains isn't exactly destroying the environment. And he pauses mm -hmm. and he says, I didn't know better. I think you were trying to turn me against this child. <laughs> What he means by that is the way we present something, we've already tried to maneuver our coach or our supervisor into thinking in a certain way, which is why I say they can't be in charge. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. We bring out our own narrative and often project yes. them into uh, our clients. And then... Yeah. Particularly when coaches come to supervision, they tell their own story of exactly. who they think that client is. Yes, exactly. You know, you, you know. So I'm not saying anything that's really, I'm just saying it a little bit provocatively, but you, you know this. I'm not going to tell you anything today that you don't already know. Ah, you know, what's important is not me, because I'm a facilitator of um, giving people who may be listening to this an insight into some of your perspectives. I'm already a fan of your perspective, but I'm sure some people will hear this and they might have not thought about how much of their own story are they projecting into their client's stories. So I think it's incredibly important. Any reminder is very welcome, even if it's revisiting something that seems quite foundational. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, um, so I learned that coaches really believed it was about out there. And my approach is perhaps the complete opposite of saying it's all an inside job. Mm -hmm. And then once they've recognized it's an inside job, we can then go back to the external and look at strategy. But if we go straight to strategy without looking at the fact that it's an inside job, the client or the, or the coachee or the supervisee or whoever it is it doesn't matter we'll still we'll feel somehow we're trying to maneuver them into a solution yeah. and what i'm trying to do is uncover the blocks so I'm, i'm saying something completely paradoxical i'm saying you've got to be in charge to let mm -hmm. them be in charge i don't mean you stay in charge you find the part of them that knows better that knows something but not yeah. through listening to them by interrupting their narrative right and this is i think what's what's going to be very fascinating to many people about your particular approach on this it's that 
we're working, we're, we're using ourselves. You said it's an inside job, right? We're using what's going on for us in order to bring this into the relationship in order for our clients to be able to transform and change sure. um, and move their own path. Could you, could you say a bit more about um, why it's so important to use what's going on for yourself and paradoxically uh, helping the other person? Uh, how does that look like in practice? Uh, you became your voice became quite journalistic then. <laughs> well, we are investigating in some sense, right? <laughs> now I was just laughing at the change of tone in your voice. Um, <laughs> it was like uh, um, a recent example, which is very moving. So you know how I work. I focus on what's going on inside me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was doing a demonstration, and this woman brings a client. And she's having difficulty with her. And I interrupt her story. And I say, I notice I've got a lot of energy in my mouth. So she says, yes, she talks a lot. And, mm. you know, that was just no impact. And then mm. I said, I I'm noticing I'm feeling angry. Not with you, I said, to, to explain. I said, I'm just noticing anger is passing through me. And she said, yes, this is a very angry woman. And again, no impact. It was just like you've told me something I already knew. Never mind that you got there because you were focusing on my, yourself, not me. But, you, you know, you're not telling me anything new. And then I sat with, I said, just let me sit with this anger. And I closed my eyes. Again, a very peculiar thing to do, apparently. And I said, you know what's coming up is I feel bereft. And she went, oh, my God. So that's what's behind. Yes, that's what's behind this woman. She can't face her grief. So she's angry and she talks and she tells stories and everything right inside. And she said, you know what? Do you know how I couldn't get her there? I can't face my own bereftness, she said. And then I said, the three of us are all in the same boat. I can't face the depths of my bereftness and grief and at that moment I the supervisee and the client were all connected I just started with me but it wasn't just about me it was just like using me to access the supervisee and through accessing the supervisee access their client and it was a very moving uh, people were astonished and it was just like she'll go back to her client and it could be a coach, it doesn't matter, with fresh eyes. She will have understood something. She's no longer, she said, I don't even feel angry with her anymore. It's like mm -hmm. you completely changed my perspective about how to work with her. Mm -hmm. And I think the same could be true of coaching, even though it's about what you do rather than who you are. Well, it's all, they overlap anyway. But I, I think that until you've made that connection at that level, I would suggest that all activity can be, I'm not saying it always is, can be an avoidance of the intimacy. Because mm -hmm. at that moment, it was a very, very intimate thing because I, I didn't leave it with the supervisee and their client. I said, me too. I don't, I don't do grief well. Yes. And this is what I've, I've heard you say before. It's, it's trust your feelings, trust what's going on for you as a practitioner. And it, I think it definitely expands to coaching when we coach somebody and we have what what might feel courageous to some, what uh, I have heard you say doesn't feel courageous to you because you just give voice to what's going on for me, my experience, because I know in relation with our clients, this will go somewhere, this is relevant. So bringing that in can feel courageous but it just is. It's something that's going on. And through that, our clients will perhaps understand, have insights, learning about what's going on in their relationships. It doesn't have to be a coach that we're working with in supervision and their relationship with their client. It could be we are the coach and our client is exploring their relationships around them. Sure, sure. It's, it's relevant for all relationships. And what one of the things I say is if I... I'm focusing on you. There's nobody at home. 
Huh. But if I focus on myself and I'm sensitive to you, I am picking up what's going on inside you under the surface, not with your content of your story, but under the surface. And so um, it's almost as if like we're creating we're connected through an umbilical cord. Huh. Wow, a strong metaphor. Yeah. We're connected at that level, like mother and baby. And literally, when I go inside, I sort of feel it like around my tummy button a lot, a lot of the time. Huh. And it's like we're, I'm putting out an umbilical cord to connect with you. And... So I'm focusing on myself, but if I'm connected to you, I'm connecting to your deeper self as well as my own. And in huh. connecting to your deeper self, you're going to be much more open to connecting with the client or so the huh. coach or whoever is so his deeper self. And then when we look at strategy, because I'm not against looking at strategy, we're doing it with a much softer eye rather than trying to get success to deal with our fear of failure. Mm -hmm. That feels like a really, really intimate connection that you're creating there, especially when we look at it with an umbilical cord metaphor. There, there seems to be some, some nurturing, some passing down uh, of, of, uh, of care, um, mm -hmm. but very, very intimate. Yes, and it is. Um, I mean, I don't work as a coach, so I I can only I supervise coaches, but I don't work as a coach. But I, I will only do a one-to-one -one with a person. I do mostly group work if I feel the potential for intimacy. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in producing or having them produce. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And here we are in you know the the deeply person-centered humanistic perspective of putting the relationship to to our clients first and then work with bringing ourselves into the space because we are the only people we really have access to in your language you know the client doesn't exist we exist the client exists through us exactly so what would you what you what would you say to somebody who says well we shouldn't really share what's going on for us because we should really focus on the client uh, a psychoanalyst or a coach who might be wanting to be a step removed because they don't, they, they, maybe they fear or they're concerned that they're going to be influencing a client or maybe guiding them or impacting them through their own experience. They don't want to uh, share their own experience perhaps or their, their thoughts or their emotions because they're concerned that they're having too much of an influence on their clients. They want the client to lead the way and do what's good for them. And I know some of that you've already alluded to, but I wondered if somebody's listening to this now and saying, oh, but I shouldn't get too involved. You know, maybe my, my uh, supervisor or coach training school or I read in a book is that I shouldn't get too involved with my clients. What would you say to that? The world is crazy. It's all upside down. When I report, Port back, I'm feeling energy in my mouth, or I'm feeling angry, or I feel bereft. I'm not getting involved. In fact, it's the opposite. I'm actually being a witness to myself and encouraging them to be a witness to themselves. So actually, the involvement, the umbilical cord is one, is on one level, on another level, it's a spiritual path about um, developing the witness. And I talk about supervision as a spiritual path. Um, and what we're doing is when I said I felt bereft, I wasn't getting involved. I was simply recognizing that bereftness was in the field from the clients, the supervisee to me. But I didn't start saying, yes, and my father and my mother and my this or my that. It was, yes, I, I, I struggle with bereftness too. And then we move on because we've acknowledged it. And so what you do is you acknowledge, but you don't dwell in it. The getting too involved is when you dwell on it. So what, what makes that... Into consciousness. Sorry, go ahead, Robin. Just bring it into consciousness. The reference mm -hmm. is in the field. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you the story of my early childhood. I'm just noticing that I can feel bereft and I don't find it easy to face the grief. 
And that's it. I'm not going to tell you my story. Hmm. What if they ask for it? Tell me more. I'll say, why do you need to know? I'm not going to do it. It's not that I withhold it. It's not relevant. What's relevant is there it, the impact of my saying I feel bereft. So if you said to me, I said, well, I'm working with you, and I say, yes, I feel bereft, and you say you feel bereft, and you say, well, tell me more about yours, Robin. I would just simply say, why do you want to focus on mine? How will it help you? Mm -hmm. Maybe, Maybe there's I something to learn from you about how you deal with your experience of bereftment. Maybe there's, you know, putting myself in the client's shoes. Mm -hmm. Many clients want to learn from coaches and sometimes expect that they share their expertise and their knowledge so that we can maybe adopt some of that. Mm. I, think, I think there is a place for that. But actually, right now, and if I check inside, I'm wondering if what the impact of, my, of, of bringing bereftness into the conversation is on you. Mm -hmm. And I notice that the first thing that happens is that you want to focus on me. And of course I can tell you about me. It's not a problem. I don't need to hide anything. But the first response was to focus on me, not on yourself. Mm -hmm. So I bring it to the here and now, and I resist the invitation. Yeah. And, you know, this morning I had to supervise somebody, which was kind of more like therapy, really. She's, she, I think she's more of a client. And I was sharing about, you know, how I dealt with, when I was younger, how I dealt with um, people I fancied, because she talks about always going for the wrong men. And I was saying, yeah, that, that's just part of what, we seem to do as human beings. I was quite open about it because I thought it would really help her to know about me. But I'm very, very careful about sharing about me. I would only do it if I really felt that it was important. And then the little role play that we did then, it was the deflection. And how do I know the difference between really a deflection and somebody and being valuable? I don't know. It's a feeling. I can, I can sense when somebody's deflecting, pretending to be interested in me. I'm not pretending, that's not, a, that's, that's not a fair word, but using me to perhaps avoid something in themselves. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you mentioned supervision as a spiritual path, and yeah. I know a lot of people would very much resonate with coaching as a spiritual path. Could you right. say a bit more about um, what, what makes that spiritual? What makes coaching spiritual then? Now, when you talk about supervision as a spiritual path, so what's the spirituality element? Well, how, like, you call it spiritual, a spiritual path on a, for a reason. So I just wanted to uh, explore that and flesh that out a little bit more. I'm going to be a little tricky here and say, what would you imagine? Uh -huh. um, well, I imagine a spiritual path. Hmm. I'm I'm torn between giving giving you my perspective of what I imagine and wondering why you are curious about my imagination. <laughs> exactly what we've done uh -huh. <laughs> uh, uh, a minute ago when when we exactly. were the you know, um, the reason I'm asking is that it'll help me to know how to pitch what I'm saying when I so, right um, it's not uh, of course I'm going to answer your question without you know and i brought it in so that we could have it on the table mm -hmm. but i just want to get your perspective so that i can kind of if you say something i'll go yeah, yeah you, you've said exactly what i would have said or if you say something i go have you thought about this it'll give me something to play off yeah so i i guess the first instinct of asking the question for me was uh, spirituality has been used in so many contexts Uh, that in at some point uh, as part of my training, I remember a session on spirituality, and in the end, the conclusion seemed to be it's whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Um, so it's difficult to put a frame around what it means a spiritual path. So that's why I'm asking uh, what it means to you and um, how that how what that would look like and what makes it spiritual. Good. Now you've explained your context is much easier for me to answer the question mm -hmm. and i 
agree with you. There's a lot that passes for spirituality. There's a load of bollocks, if you'll excuse my language. <laughs> um, well, you're welcome. <laughs> um, it's 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 um, what we used to call in the business syrup upon shit. Um, so it's all fluffy and it's not thought through. And I see a lot of that um, in spiritual communities, which are full of underground tensions and rivalries and competitiveness and all sorts of things. So um, um, I don't mean anything floaty or so I, I like your saying that it could pass for anything because a lot of people do. What I mean by it. Um, is it teaches me to not be attached. So I try and disengage you from your story in the same way as in my own personal life, I try to disengage from my story. Because when I'm telling a story, I'm not telling the truth. I'm telling a story. And I'm not looking at that this is just my version of it. I'm treating it as if it was the truth. So if I tell you, for example, example oh, oh i'm having real difficulties with my wife she did this she did that she did the other all of which would be factually true but irrelevant because mm-hmm. actually i am attached to the story of she did that and she did that mm-hmm. and what supervision does is enables the supervisee to detach from their story about their client mm-hmm. So in the same way as a coach would work with a client's story and helping them to become aware of the story they tell themselves about themselves. Yes. Yeah, there's a a similarity, except that I I feel that coaching somehow, supervision for me, but then I'm not doing um, clinical supervision, I'm doing consultative supervision because I don't, have any investment in the outcome so i'm not trying to it's different if you're doing managerial or clinical supervision where you're responsible for the supervisee's caseload supervision i do why i call it spiritual path whereas i think anything can be spiritual path just as you said but why is that i have no investment in trying to change the client or fix them or anything like that I'm doing a process of inquiry. And I mm. think supervision is such a good process of inquiry. Mm-hmm. And I think often the most powerful coaching work stems from a similar route in that when the coach is not attached or not feeling yeah. responsible for what the client is doing, because the responsibility lies with the client and they purely help them in a line of inquiry and yeah. reflective practice then often we do our best work as coaches. Exactly. And what happens is, is that where coaching can get stuck, and I said this at the beginning, then I didn't put enough context around it, is when there's a three-way contract and the organization needs the person to change. Mm -hmm. Or the person's going for a promotion or something. In other words, where there's more than just the two of you in the room. Yeah. Yeah as a sponsor of some sort or somebody else yes. who's a stakeholder that we feel responsible towards. Yes. That's where I think it can get lost. Mm-hmm. Um, your very early colleague, um, Peter Hawkins, uh, you've spent a lot of time uh, with Peter, um, who was the, I think they called it warden at the time uh, when you were with your, together with your wife as well in, uh, I forgot the name of the institution that we were training in. Um, when you were in your twenties, yeah, we were. Um, it was a halfway house and run as a therapeutic community for people coming out of um, psychiatric hospital, and run as a, as a community where they learn, as well as having therapy, they mm-hmm. learn practical skills so they wouldn't have to go back into hospital. They could go and get their own flat. So we would teach them life skills as well as doing therapy with them. Mm-hmm. Not that life skills were as important if or more than the actual therapy because yeah. they had to learn to decorate, cook, um, clean, a uh, garden. Uh, so, and we treated everything as part of the therapy, yeah. And um, it was called the Richmond Fellowship. Richmond Fellowship, that was it. 
and they had 21 houses when I was working for them. And we were the training house for the whole organization. So Peter, in particular Peter, but all three of us devised a supervision policy for the whole organization because supervision wasn't in, particularly in place then. It was, and we, we insisted that it was the, the foundation for the whole of the work. And I know that if I hadn't have had good supervision, I would have burnt out. Absolutely, 24-7. I once worked 19 days on the trot um, and I wasn't burnt out because I knew I could always get good supervision. Yeah, it speaks to the importance of reflective practice as yeah. a space to regenerate. Yeah. Um, the reason I brought it up is because, uh, as you will know, Peter did a lot of work um, in, in the systemic uh, environment, bringing in particularly the um, the ecosystem, the you know, putting climate change in into people's awareness, looking for other stakeholders. And it, it feels like there's a lot of, I know a lot of coaches and it feels like from, from when I hear Peter talk about it, that there is a, an assumed responsibility towards another party. So in the context of what you just said, in terms of uh, not really caring about the outcome, there is an outcome that I know a lot of coaches really care about. Um, so it, it feels a challenge to detach ourselves from the responsibility of what is the outcome of our coaching work. And I'm, I wonder if you had thoughts about that, if that's something on your mind, if maybe you've something you talked to Peter about, or maybe this has already been in your awareness back in the, in the 70s and 80s. No, um, wasn't in the 70s and 80s. And I have a viewpoint, which isn't like every viewpoint, it's just an opinion. And I think that we, uh, when we attach to our opinion, it becomes part of our identity. So I'm very careful to say it's just an opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so my opinion, my viewpoint, if you like, whatever, is um, based on an article I wrote 25 years ago called How Green Is Your Mind? Huh. And I ask people to imagine that they are a car and that their brain is the exhaust pipe, and that every time they have a negative thought, they're polluting the planet. Wow. So I say that if you are fighting, going on the M25 and sitting down and protesting, you are polluting the planet because you are making the others, you are, you are making others other. And that thought of othering is what creates the pollution because you, you, you're into goodies and baddies and of course we're the goodies and they're the baddies but of course they think we're the baddies and they're the goodies and you're into a, a, a whole the way the human mind works and I said that's at the root of climate change we, we are actually we can focus on these fossil fuels and god knows what else but if you've got a fossil fuel inside your mind with your thoughts That to me is more polluting than the actual physical fossil fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And I said, why I start there is because it's the only thing you have control over. You do not have control over the way the world is. You fight the, the person who, who coal mine, who's in the who's president of the coal mine industry or whatever. You're in opposition, and that the opposition creates pollution. You mm -hmm. look at why you need to project onto them, your fear around what they're doing, you own your fear, and then you see that um, they're just doing what they do and you're doing what you do, and who knows what the, what the truth ultimately is. We just mm -hmm. don't know. Mm -hmm. We just don't know. Maybe it's right that the whole world collapses and we start again. Who knows? But mm -hmm. we're run by opinions and... There are people who will say, but it's a fact. And I'm saying, well, it is and it isn't. Just like there is no fact and no client, is it possible that there is no world? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh. And that, that connects quite well with something you said earlier, like what we talked about earlier, with bringing our own feelings and emotions, what's going on for us into the space with our clients. And at some point I heard you advocate for 
the crucial importance of being very aware of what what we are bringing into the space yeah. so that we can make better decisions yes. in terms of which of our these emotions or our experiences are relevant for the yeah. client in our relationship or what's just our stuff that maybe is better kept in the box yes um, yeah i think so there's something else i wanted to say to you um but about how green is your mind it's uh, we take responsibility for our thinking and our thinking our thinking is, is crazy my thinking is crazy your thinking is crazy the world the world operates is crazy because we are having to always try and prove that our that we are right mm -hmm. because basically deep down we feel we're wrong and i don't care how successful anyone appears there is in every human being, almost every human being, almost every human being, a belief that somehow we're wrong, bad, inadequate. And I'm not talking about people with low self-esteem. I'm talking about you and I who are reasonably successful and mm -hmm. good at what we do. But you dig down and you'll find something that feels has got shame in it, guilt, whatever. You dig mm -hmm. down far enough. And then what I'm trying to do in, in this work is bring this to awareness not therapy, bring it to awareness so it can be forgiven. Yeah, and if so like everybody feels like that, at least sometimes. And I'm sure a lot of coaches listening to this will be sitting there and thinking, oh, it's not, it's not just me. It, it's also Robin. It's also Yannick. Yeah, I definitely have sat there and questioned, who am I to do this or to do that? Who put me in this position? And somebody is going to find out that I don't actually know anything. And I, well, huh, all of us don't know the people who are the most dangerous, the people who think they know something. Yeah. <laughs> because actually, and I can, I can join that club because I sometimes think I know. And <laughs> it's very amusing. When I co work with my wife, I can really sound quite eloquent, eloquent and articulate. And she'll turn to the group and she'll say, don't believe a word of what he says. He doesn't live any of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, my wife does the same. Uh, not in front of groups usually, but... <laughs> I love it because what she does is it sounds like she's confronting, but she isn't. She's really supporting me by mm -hmm. saying, Robin, I'm not going to let you get inflated. And even though you're talking really well at the moment and the group's hanging on to your every word, I am not going to let this dynamic continue for mm -hmm. your sake and their sake. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. And I always um, say if we ever got divorced, I think I'd stop working. Huh. Because to me, she, and I, I want to honour her just like I want to honour Peter, um, she... doesn't allow me to believe my own hype. Mm. And believe you me, I can believe my own hype. <laughs> so, and by the way, so my, I know what I wanted to say to you. I have a very different opinion to Peter. I go, how green is your mind? And he goes, we have a responsibility to the planet. I think they're quite different. Mm -hmm. And I'll say so. And, and maybe Peter and I will talk about this together. I don't mean we aren't responsible to the planet but it's not where you start mm -hmm. yeah yeah i get that um i, I want to leave that there and just um just want to pick up the point before the two of us seem to be uh, blessed with a wife who's offering that kind of value this kind of you know, maybe challenge, but from a very loving perspective. Sure. And I think this is where coaching, supervision, even a good friend is offers such a valuable service to us mm -hmm. by um, by calling us out on these things, but from a very loving, supportive perspective. Sure. And it's an it's an art to deliver it in that way. And I think it's also a skill to be learned to receive something like that, because. 
sometimes we as coaches, I'm sure many have had an experience of that, that we we challenge a client or we call them out on something like this from a very loving perspective with loving intentions. And the client gets very defensive or angry. Um, and being met with with that is uh, can be a difficult experience. And I think a lot of coaches will be holding back from offering this kind of loving challenge uh, out of fear that they might be met with defensiveness or even aggression. So? So just to hone down the point, I guess, that, uh, you know, this is part of the value that we provide as coaches, as supervisors, as partners and friends. When I said so like that, I meant so the client gets angry with them. So. Oh, right. (laughs) <laughs> See, it he, he was me getting defensive. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I'll give you an example that happened about a month ago. Uh-huh. So I'm doing core beliefs with people. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you know what a core belief is? People should never lie. Uh, people should look after the planet. Um, mm-hmm. All that sort of, all the shoulds and how people should behave. Mm-hmm. And I start off with something very simple, like men are, and women are, and they just say the first thing that comes into their heads. <laughs> We're excited. Show that we've all got. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I just said, oh, uh, exciting and possibly yeah. exclusive. <laughs> yeah. So people are shouting out their answers. It's on Zoom, and you know, men are wonderful. Men are bastards. Or <laughs> women are delightful. Women are bitches. Well, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> um, this guy explodes and he said i just said two words about men and women and you never even listen to them you know you you just didn't want to hear, hear my words you wanted it all to be nice and fluffy and this is another fucking course that doesn't look at the shadow and i'm trying to get the shadow in and you want to be all nice and fluffy and he just went for me like crazy wow. and i um so this is why my why I said so like that. So uh, I listened to him and I said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You're right, I didn't hear you. And Joan came in and said, oh, aren't you generous to this man? Gosh, willing to be that angry. What a generous gift. And I uh-huh. said, yes, I, I experienced it as generous too. You're really showing me how much this matters to you. So the only point I take issue with is that you compare us to other courses. I don't mind you being furious with me, but I didn't really like the comparison. He apologized for the comparison. And I said, you know, I can eat shadow for breakfast. I'm not, I don't understand what you, and then other people said, but we didn't hear him either because when you're on Zoom, you only get the dominant voices. So in Mm. fact, nobody heard him. But Mm. what was interesting is that we framed his so-called attack as an act of generosity mm. yes the I one think... to say when you're telling me coaches are don't want to confront because they're frightened of the client getting angry i think if you can't have a client get fucking angry with you stop working mm. <laughs> because what you'll be doing is at some level you'll be placating them yeah and that is not authentic yeah yeah, I say that often when when we are met when or when strong emotions arise, there's mm. something to learn. Yes. Whether they're elated and laughing hysterically or they're getting fucking angry, yeah. you know, there's something that points to something that's very important to them. Yeah. What a wonderful learning opportunity, exactly. and how wonderful to frame it as that sort of gift. Yeah, that's what we did, and, and in fact, at the end, he wanted to work with me privately as a group. And I, I said no because I don't do much private work, one to one work now. But what, what, what I just said something very dogmatic, and like anything dogmatic, it'll have some of my own stuff in. So, um, but I just said if you can't take a person's aggression, if you're not willing to do the challenge because you're frightened of a, a negative reaction, I said you shouldn't be in this job. And that was a bit of an overstatement. But I, mm-hmm. what I wanted to do was to wake people up about how much they're adapting to give the person what they think they want as opposed to what they need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Mm. Um, I'm having an eye on the time and I, I did want to talk about transformation specifically because you 
you wrote a wonderful book, Supervision as Transformation. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, I've also had a look at uh, In Love with Supervision, the subtitle being Creating Transformative Conversations. Um, at Animas, the course is specifically uh, about coaching for transformation, transformative coaching. So I wonder if you could share your perspective on, on transformation. And I appreciate this is a, a very broad question, but I'm leaving it, um, I'm leaving it uh, broad on purpose just to see how you might, how you might answer that. Um, okay, fair, fair, fair question. I've got an answer and I'm going to bring up something and I'm going to read it out to you. And this may answer your question. Um, let me see if I can find it. Here we are. This is a talk, this is a workshop I'm going to run for Ashridge Conference, and this will explain to you what I think possibly transformation is or isn't. Mm-hmm. It's called Your Royal Highness. Your Royal Highness, as in I, uh, what we look with. Pardon? Your Royal Highness, as in Highness, or the the um, the eyes as we're looking onto something. It's an I, capital I in inverted commas. Oh, Highness, that makes sense. Ha, okay. And it's a pun on the on the how the I, the ego, is a process that dominates our lives. So your Royal Highness is a pun on your uh-huh. Royal Highness. And your royal highness, lurching between grandiosity and insecurity. We are very committed to selling ourselves, world and in brackets, world thought leader, global this or that. But who is this I that we promote? And is there another I who is fearful and insecure? Supposing the idea of a separate I is an illusion, there might be a relief from not spending energy puffing it up or feeling defensive when someone seems to threaten it? Are you willing to question its existence, to question not only your thoughts, but the way you think? Not a rearranging of the deck chairs, but a welcoming sinking of the ship. We will examine concepts like paradox, shadow, undoing, try an enlightenment intensive exercise, introduce Ho'oponopono forgiveness technique, perhaps try some improvisation drama where we can't know what will happen next. Our aim is to inquire into the insecurity that comes from weaving the new clothes of the Emperor I. By the end, my wish is that you understand when I say I hope you, inverted commas, will get nothing out of this. Have you gone? Um, I I just wanted to pause to see if there's more. Ah. Um, So with transforming comes from the I that we tell we tell the story about that we create transformation means inquiring into who, into who this i is and in fact actually it's an illusion perhaps because there's so many eyes depending on what kind of contexts we're in and we tell ourselves different stories on different days or even different times of the day that's right so there's no there's no there is no eye. there's multiple eyes um, but there is something that's observing the multiple eyes. And it's that something that creates the transformation when we access that something. The multiple eyes are just doing their thing, but what's who is the eye behind that, all those multiple eyes? Uh-huh. So, yeah. It's it, remi- the duality. it reminds me of, uh, of internal family systems, uh, Richard yeah. Schwartz's self yeah. with a capital S. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's got a lot of similarity with that. Um, the, the idea that all these protectors and what, what's the other word that he uses? Protectors and um, um, all these different parts anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a self behind them all. Mm-hmm. And the transformation is accessing this self rather than the different being stuck in the, the narratives of the different parts. Right. So through a process of inquiry and reflection, we start to get to know what these different stories are that we tell ourselves, these different eyes that we have created to uncover behind the kind of I, the kind of self that can change the narrative. 
the eye doesn't try and do anything, it just is. Because that's another part, which, trying to change the narrative is still part of the I world. Uh -huh. So in that sense, it's not a process of change. It's a process of returning back yes. to, to the I. Yes, to the real I, not the personality I or the parts I. So you, you, I don't know how it came across when I read this. There's a whole Ashridge conference next September on identity. And what I was mm -hmm. saying is that the transformation comes from finding out who we really are. Mm -hmm. Rather than, so I'll read the sentence again because people like this sentence. Not a rearranging of the deck chairs, but a welcome sinking of the ship. Welcome sinking of the ship. Wow. A welcome sinking of the ship, yes. Yeah. In other words, we don't try and kind of, most of the work that we do, I do, we do, is rearranging the deck chairs at some subtle level. Yeah, I think a lot of coaching uh, suffers from that. Yes, that's what I said at the beginning and, yeah. and come back to it. Um, when we're talking about a sinking of the ship, it's like once we can welcome the sinking of the ship, whatever that means metaphorically, yeah. we reduce the fear. Yeah. And there's no fear because we're always trying to protect ourselves from fear and we haven't had time to really look at fear and how the world is dominated by fear mm -hmm. um, and when you're in this i or self as schwartz would call it there is no fear mm -hmm. and i could talk so much about fear um and how success the real fear of failure and how we're being driven by it. Um, mm -hmm. And, oh, I don't know where to start. It's a huge topic, <laughs> maybe another time. Yeah, I think it might uh, go beyond what we have scope for. The yeah. immediate fear that seems particularly relevant to me in the coaching context is that when people, clients' fear of letting go of these eyes that they have invested so much yeah. time and energy building up yeah. that it's it's very anxiety provoking to imagine or to even consider letting that go letting it sink even though it can help us transform you know that we're holding on to these these frameworks that we've built and these narratives that we build because who is that person underneath and i think that's a that's a big fear that clients bring And many coaches don't quite get to break through to because it, there's a responsibility. It takes it takes quite some skill to hold somebody as their ship is sinking sure. and to help them recreate something so that they can feel safe. So I think coaches need to ask themselves, I mean, do you have such a broad body of knowledge and experience and having worked with people in the darkest of places, most coaches don't have that and they don't have access to that and they may not feel capable or even willing to do that kind of work so it, it well do it um it's my suggestion um it's like you obviously do it because you you know um you know about family systems and you know you know you're obviously not just a standard coach you're in integrating a lot of other things but if a coach doesn't keep exploring keep exploring keep exploring What they do is they either get complacent or they are shutting unconsciously shutting down their clients or coaches when anything becomes too emotional, too risky. Mm -hmm. And what I want to feel is that people can go anywhere when they sit with me, mm -hmm. wherever they need to go. So having said, the client, I take charge, I also say the opposite that people, I'll let people go wherever they need to go. Mm -hmm. And because I've been lucky enough to have gone psychotic myself, because um, I ate some dope in Israel 50 or three years ago. <laughs> I read that in your book. I, <laughs> I meant to ask you about it. Yeah, what an experience. And I was just psychotic for about two hours. Um, It was a paranoid, no? A paranoid state. Totally paranoid. And it was such a gift because I heard myself say, There's no fear, the fear is inside me. And so when I worked with psychiatric patients 
I heard two of them talking about me because I was able to describe the psychotic state to them. And I heard one of them say to the other, he's one of us. Mm. And I took that as a compliment. Yeah. So, so I'm not frightened of craziness because having been there myself, um, I kind of know. And so if you want to develop yourself as a coach, go to your shadow side, go to your dark places. Don't use more techniques and more diplomas and more this and more that. Go to your darkest of places and really see that you can survive being in them. And then your clients will feel even safer with you. Mm. That's probably why psychedelics are on the rise uh, oh, in the yes. in the not just in the therapy uh, communities, but yeah. also in personal development and personal growth, because some of these trips can lead to uh, very psychotic experiences. And what people call bad trips uh, remind me of what you've experienced in Israel that back then, a temporary state of of insanity or paranoia mm -hmm. um, that can really open some doors of understanding what it what it might be like. Not necessarily an experience that uh, many people will be seeking out on purpose, um, but you never know in which way a trip will go. Well, a bad trip can be useful, as as is, was the case with me. But mostly, if you're careful, you can you can have a good trip. But even I would, I'm not here recommending people go on trips. I'm just saying what happened to me. Likewise, uh, and I'm really saying, but be willing to explore your shadow side and. Uh, I love Byron Katie's quote, if you want to know the truth, get an enemy. Huh. Because the enemy will show you your shadow, which your friends never will. Mm -hmm. And the more you know about the shadow, the more comfortable you will be in allowing clients to go where they need to go. Mm -hmm. So let's keep working on ourselves. And that's what I always appreciated about the profession. Well, profession about the, the path. Uh, maybe better to call it, yes. um, of working with people. Part of the, our work is to be really attuned with ourselves and to continuously grow and explore ourselves in relation to other people, um, which is hugely uh, attractive to me uh, yeah. as, part of, as part of coaching or generally in the helping by talking universe, as I sometimes call it. Yes. yes. I'm just aware that we are close to our hour. Indeed. Any last words, Robin? Um, no, thank you. I've enjoyed talking to you. Um, I think we have more talking to do. Um, mm. That's another stage, perhaps. Um, I just feel slightly anxious because I, I say very bold statements, which taken out of context, I think, oh, my God. Um, like, you know, if you can't take your anger from a client, get out of the profession. And I was thinking, that's a bit extreme. Um, so I say these things and I sort of then want to sort of put them a, a bit of context around them. Um, so I don't know if I've said anything too controversial. Um, uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, I think we need voices that make us think. And sometimes it's, it's good to put something out there that really turns somebody's head yeah. to think about something. Yeah. And I think I trust our community of listeners here that if they take issue with something or offense with something, hopefully they respect the two of us enough to get very fucking angry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Just what I was, we were talking about. If we get angry, we get angry. Yes. Uh, and that, that's fine. It was more like, um, I, I wouldn't be frightened of somebody getting angry, but I don't, I guess I have a, a fear of, somewhere being misunderstood mm. rather than yeah and when the guy got really angry with me i didn't mind at all because i did i apologized but it's when people i don't know so i've just uh, found a fear of being misunderstood and yeah. now i've voiced it i'm not i'm not worried bothered at all yeah so I think the important thing is that you were there when that guy got angry mm. and we are one step removed. If somebody's mm. really angry or upset right now by something that you or I have said, uh, we are not there to hold that space for them. So 
if that's you <laughs> at the moment, uh, we invite you to use that uh, for reflection and perhaps mm. uh, get inspired by some of the, the principles that we put mm. out here today and try to use it for your growth. Maybe, yeah. maybe work with your own coach. I'm sure most of the listeners will work with their own coaches at the moment, given that your coach is yourself. So. Thank you. That puts a nice context around it. And I was just thinking that if people do want to know a bit more about the way I think and work, a, a lot of it is in, in the book In Love with Supervision. Mm -hmm. I really, um, I, I think we try and put everything that we've done on paper. Um, I don't know how it reads to you, but I'm pleased that we've got all that I wanted to say It's in our book. It's really, really excellent. I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, written together with your wife, Joan, and just very personal, very lots of really, really good stuff in it. So if anybody wanted to explore uh, Robin's perspective a bit more, it's a fantastic entry point to, um, to your work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm pleased about it. And I feel it really does represent. Um, and we introduced people like Byron, Katie, and... Um, the um, Charles Eisenstein at the end, who's a really good thinker. So it's not, it, it's about people who've influenced us as well. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I, I, I do like the book. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Robin, thank you so much for making time for us. Yeah. And uh, thank you for your work over the last many decades. I hope you got a couple of more decades uh, to so. inspire others. And thank you for asking me. Yeah, and I enjoyed it. Enjoyed talking to you. Wonderful. Robin, thank you very much and speak soon, I hope. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.